Today we're going to look at a really classic math puzzle and it can really come down to the silly question of why the square root of 2 is not equal to 2. Well, of course, we could answer that by saying, well, if you square the square root of 2, you get 2, but if you square 2, you get 4. But of course, that's not really what we're getting at here. We're looking at this like, we're looking at this seemingly geometric contradiction. So let's look at it a little bit more closely. So let's say we've got the line, maybe we could call it y equals x, and it goes from the origin to the point 1, 1. So by the Pythagorean theorem, that's pretty clearly of length square root of 2, that line segment at least. But we could also approximate this line segment by, well, perhaps this collection of four line segments on the x-axis from 0 to 1 half, and then a vertical line segment from that point up to this point half-half on our original line, and then another horizontal line segment, and then another vertical line segment. And so that's a pretty bad approximation, but observe that the length of that approximating collection of line segments is half plus half plus half plus half. In other words, it's two. And if you don't like that approximation, well, we could maybe do one more iteration of that approximation, and that's in this blue. So we go from here to here, so that's to a quarter along the x-axis, and then we take a vertical line segment up to the point quarter quarter, and then another horizontal, and then another vertical, and then another horizontal, and a vertical, and a horizontal, and a vertical. And observe, that gives us a collection of eight line segments. And those eight line segments have length quarter, 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 quarter. But of course, if you add all of those up, you get a length of two again. So even though this more closely approximates our original line segment, the length is still two. And we could do maybe one more step in this red and observe that there we're going to get what? 16 little line segments each of length one half. And again, the total length there is two, even though you're getting even closer to the yellow line. And of course, you could keep doing this over and over and over again, and each time, you're gonna get something like one over two m plus one line segments of length one over two to the m. But of course, if you add up two to the m plus one line segments that are each length one over two to the m, you'll get a length of two. So observe that the length of the approximating curves is always two, and those approximating curves limit to this line segment of length square root of two. So something is amiss here because of course we know that the square root of two is not equal to two. So the purpose of the video today is to figure out what's going on here. And, well, we're going to do that with a bit of calculus and look at the result that may be mistakenly applied in this so-called proof that 2 equals root 2. Okay, so let's get going by defining some curves. And they're going to be parametrized by t. And so here I'll call f sub zero of t, I'll let that be equal to the following curve. So it'll have coordinates t comma zero, as long as t is between zero and one. And then it'll have coordinates one comma, let's see, t minus one, as long as t is between one and two. So let's see. This first bit between zero and one will give us, well, something that's actually not on the board right now, but let's get it written on the board. And so that would be a line segment up here to this point along the x-axis at the point one, zero, and then straight up until we hit our line. And so the first portion of that function takes us to this point one, zero, and the second portion is like an elevator to the point one, one. So let's maybe put here in purple that this is f sub zero of t. Maybe we'll put a purple dot over here as well. And then our next bit, this magenta dot, will be what we'll call f sub one of t. 
and that'll be a slightly better approximation. And there we're gonna need four pieces because there's like, well, four little branches of this, you know, stepping type function. So it'll be equal to t comma zero as long as t is between zero and a half. It'll be equal to, let's see, one half and then t minus one half as long as t is between one half and one. And so that would be this first uh, vertical line segment here. And then it'll be equal to t minus a half and then comma a half as long as t is between uh, one and three halves. So that'll be this second horizontal line segment. And then finally, it'll be equal to one t minus one as long as t is between three halves and one. So that'll be this last vertical line segment here. And then, well, let's maybe go ahead and write that over here in our magenta color. So that's f sub one of t. And then you could similarly draw a picture for f sub two of t, which is in this blue color. And then you could also draw maybe an equation over there for f sub three of t as well, which is in this red color. But that being said, I think it's like fairly straightforward to write down a function for f sub, I'll call it m of t, or maybe f sub n of t in general. So let's see what that would look like. So that's gonna be made up mostly of two types of little pieces. The first type will be the type when you're moving horizontally. So those will be like these two, so the first and the third, or really the first up here. And the second type will be the type when you're moving vertically. So that'll be like the second one right here or the second and fourth one right here. So let's see, the ones moving horizontally will look something like this. So you'll have a coordinate of t minus m over two to the n, comma, m over two to the n. So let's make sure that makes sense. So notice if m is equal to zero, well, we're gonna get exactly something like this first horizontal piece or this horizontal piece here. And then if m is equal to one, we get something like this second horizontal piece. Now we just have to figure out, well, what are the t values here? And the t values are in fact gonna be equal to something like two times m over two to the n, and then two times m plus one over two to the n. So that would be like from zero to one, for instance, or from zero to half, or from one to three halves. And this'll be for m between zero and two to the n minus one. Where observe, like I made a little typo here, this should be equal to the number two. And then you can see that it kind of is in line with what we had before. And then for our next piece, which is our vertical uh, line segments, it'll be something like this. So m over two to the n, and then after that, t minus m over two to the n. And what values of t will this be for? Well, it's gonna be from two m plus one over two to the n, and then two m plus two over two to the n. And the same values of m like we have over there. So that gives us, well, how many? Well, notice how many choices are there for m? There are two to the n choices for m. And then we get like two little branches for each of those. So that gives us two to the two n total little line segments. But that makes sense because we have two to the n going horizontally and two to the n going vertically. Like look over here for f sub zero, we get two to the zero, in other words, one going horizontally, and two to the zero, in other words, one going vertically. And then for the magenta f sub one, we have two to the one going horizontally, in other words, two, and two also going vertically. So this is in line with what we're seeing over here geometrically. Okay, and then 
Well, what would the limiting function here be? Well, I'm gonna claim that the limiting function is this thing that I'm gonna call f of t, which is gonna be t over two, t over two, and this is t values from zero to two. And you might say, well, why don't we just take it to be t comma t, and then go from zero to one? Well, I want it to have the same domain of all of these f sub n's, which the domain there is from zero to two. Okay. So now let's argue that this f sub n in fact does converge to this f sub t. We see it geometrically over here, but I wanna like do a little bit of an algebraic calculation as well. Okay, so as a reminder, here's our functions f sub n of t, which make these little stair steps with increasingly smaller stairs. And here's our limiting function, or what we're claiming is our limiting function f of t, which is clearly just this ramp here. Now, I want to maybe sketch a proof that the limit of f sub n of t is f of t for all t values between 0 and 2. So maybe let's just focus on t values from this first type, as t values from this second type are, well, essentially the same calculation. Okay. So if we've got a t from zero to two, well, then it's gonna be in one of these intervals or in one of these intervals. Like I said, let's maybe focus on this first type of interval. So let's take t on 2m over two to the n and then 2m plus one over two to the n for some m between zero and two to the n minus one, as we discussed before. Okay, and now let's look at the difference of f of t and f sub n of t. Keeping in mind by difference, I mean, well, we're really finding the length of the vector that's defined by the difference of these two vectors, because you can think about these as vectors because they're ordered pairs. So they're like two vectors. It's a vector parameterization of these curves over here. Okay, so let's see. That's gonna give us t over two comma t over two for our f of t function. And then our f sub n of t function will be, well, this thing up here, this first type, because, well, by our previous discussion. So there we have t minus m over 2 to the n comma m over 2 to the n. Okay, nice. But now we're going to simply do coordinate wise subtraction. And well, what's that going to give us? Well, we've got t over 2 minus t. That's going to give us negative t over 2 for the first co coordinate. And it'll be added to m over 2 to the n. And then for the second quarter, coordinate, we're going to have t over 2 minus m over 2 to the n. So observe, up to a sign, the first coordinate and the second coordinate are the same. So if we use our standard formula for the length of a 2 vector, so let's just recall that the length of the vector defined by a, b is the square root of a squared plus b squared. And if we have the same entry, in other words, a is equal to b, we'll simply get the square root of the length of a. So here we have the square root of two, sorry, the square root of two times the length of a. So that's gonna give us uh, the square root of two times, well, this squared taking the square root. So that's gonna be equal to t, minus m over 2 to the n. And how do we know, well, why don't we have an absolute value there? Because, well, we know because of the values of t, the first part is larger. So that gives us a positive number. Okay, but now let's observe that t is on the interval from 2m over 2 to the n and 2m plus 1 over 2 to the n. So this is going to be less than what we get if we plug in the largest possible value of t. So after plugging in that largest possible value of t, which is 
2m plus 1 over 2 to the n. And then doing a little bit of calculation, you'll see that we end up with the square root of 2 over 2 to the n. But of course, as n approaches infinity, this thing is going to approach 0. But then this length approaching 0 is the same as f sub n approaching f of t. Okay, so I think, well, we all agree that this limit is true. And now let's maybe calculate the lengths of these curves using an arc length formula. And we'll see that we get different values. And it's, then let's discuss why that's not maybe a problem. Okay, we just got done proving that for all t between 0 and 2, f sub n of t approaches f of t. And now, well, let's calculate the length of this curve f sub n of t. So let's just recall that that's going to be the integral from 0 to 2, as that's the entire domain of this line or this collection of line segments. And then we have the length of the partial of f sub n over the partial of t. The derivative of f sub n over the derivative of t. So this is something like from a multivariable calculus class. But then we can split this into pieces and the pieces are built off of this over here. So that's going to be equal to the sum as m goes from 0 up to 2 to the n minus 1 of, well, let's see, the integral from 2 to the m over 2 to the n and then 2 to the m plus 1 over 2 to the n plus the integral of the other bit. So that's going to be 2m plus 1 over 2 to the n and then 2m plus 2 over 2 to the n. And then, well, what integral are we taking here? Well, let's recall that if we take the derivative of each of these, well, this is going to give us 1 comma 0. This is going to give us 0 comma 1. You find the length of those vectors and you get 1. So this is just the length dt. But observe that that's simply calculating the length of the interval from 0 to 2 in a really convoluted and crazy way. So in the end, if you were to add all of these up, you would simply get 2. And now, well, let's compare that to the length of our original curve or our final curve, f of t. So that's going to be the same kind of formula, the derivative of f with respect to t, dt, and then that's in the length there. But let's see, that's going to be the integral from 0 to 2. And then, while well, taking the derivative of that, we're going to have the square root of 1 quarter plus 1 quarter dt. And that's pretty clear because if we take the derivative of this first entry, you get a half. Second entry, you get a half. But then you've got to square them, add them, take the square root by the definition of this length formula. But now observe, a quick calculation brings that to the square root of 2. So yes, even using calculus, these two lengths seem to contradict each other. So, well, what's going on here? Well, perhaps what we're seeing is that the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to 2 of our dfn over dt, our length of that, which was the integral way of calculating this length, is not equal to the integral from 0 to 2 of the limit as n goes to infinity of this derivative of f sub n over dt. So in other words, we can't simply take the limit inside of the integral. And in fact, the reason behind that is already on the board and it has to do with the fact that we really choose this value of t before this limit is happening. And this is called pointwise convergence. And whenever you have pointwise convergence of functions, you're not guaranteed the ability to do stuff like this. Whereas if we were to have something stronger, which of course we don't here, like uniform convergence, you would be able to bring the limit inside. Okay, so there you have it, like a calculus-based deep dive as to why this picture over here is not really a contradiction.